thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Propeller, which is a kind of configuration management system that I built myself because it was kind of too hard to uh, figure out how to use Chef or Puppet or something like that. Um, you know, I thought I could read all their documentation or I could just write my own. And this was working yesterday, and of course now it's not. Isn't that wonderful? So Propeller is written in Haskell. If I can ever get the display to work, there will be Haskell code, and there will be type errors, which are to be expected. Yay! OK. Uh, it's got a website. I believe that might be it. This is my Propeller config file. Um, so it's a Haskell program. It has some hosts in it, which are the ones that I personally own and maintain. Um, we're going to work today mostly on this host because it's kind of a throwaway host. And what I want to do is set up a quick web server using Docker. So this is a Docker. It's a propeller is based on properties. Each of these lines with an add in front of it or an ampersand in front of it is a property of this host. And propeller just goes off and makes sure that the host meets all these properties, which are defined using hassle code. So um, I want to turn this web server property. Um, I need to turn off this one because it's also using port 80. It's my, uh, I'm traveling around, I want to get an SSH into the server, so I put a SSH in port 80. If I put a bang in front instead of the ampersand, I'm sorry? If I put a bang in front instead of the ampersand, it disables the property. So I can now save this. Uh, uh, tell propeller to spin on that host. Hello. Okay. So then propeller goes off and builds itself. Oh no, there's a type error. So this is uh, actually a good thing. Um, up here it says, can't match expected type revertible property with actual type property. So the problem here is that I reverted this property, but Propeller doesn't know how to undo, there's a web server, or there's a SSH listening on this port. So let's tell it how to disable it. Um, yeah, disable, okay. Uh, file contains line though, we want it to whack the line. Um, it's not listening on that port. It's a revertible property. Um, don't ask why I have to repeat it here. Uh, there will be an explanation involving Haskell. Okay, so, thank you. Okay, what did I need to do? I'll just build it and let it tell me. What are, ah, uh, oh, I see, Okay, so, let's see if it works now. I think it built, so it's probably gonna work. Um, it's now signed it, or it's signing it using my GPG key because it's pushing to a Git repository and uh, the other host is going to pull from that repository and verify using my key to make sure that I'm not getting somebody else modifying my hosts. So all my, all my configuration is public and Propeller just operates using Git. So now it's gone off to clam.pytnet.net, which is my server, and it's checking all of its properties. And now it's pulling in the Docker uh, image that I told it to use, so it's going to have to download it. This is where, of course, demos get dicey. But uh, <clears throat> so while it's doing that, um, yeah, I, like I said before, I wrote it because it was easier to write all my own code than to try to figure out how Puppet or Chef or something like that works, and why not? You kind of learn a lot about something just by uh, going off and doing it. I might hit Control-C here in a minute because Docker is being slow today. I probably should have ran this before and let it pre-cache the image. Um, but I'm, I guarantee you that it will work. <laughs> um, and I really think that's about everything I wanted to show, although, um, eh, let's see. I'll just keep it running, so maybe I can get to the end and it'll be working. Um, mm. Oh, um, here's something else uh, that I, that's actually kind of cool. So I have this web server property, but I haven't set up the DNS yet. So let's see, how about, mm, that seems like a reasonable name to put in the DNS, and that's actually all that I need to do. I can now go tell Propeller, um, Diatom happens to be my, uh, my DNS server, and so all I have to tell it is, oh, go up to the DNS server now. And so everything is all kind of meshed together. You don't have to go worry about modifying a bunch of different files. It'll just you know, figure out everything. And I don't even have to um, go manually do this. It'll update every half an hour anyway from the Perl config. And uh, yeah, I think you can probably ping uh, hello world.kitenet.net now or yeah, about now and it should work. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so you know that it works to that degree. I guarantee the Docker stuff also works. Um, I showed you how you can revert a property by putting a bang in front, of it, uh, in front of it. And when I'm done with this demo, I'll just go in and put a bang back in front of that web server and then it'll go and delete the Docker image and that kind of thing. So yeah, that's really all there is to it. It is Haskell, but it's not hard Haskell. I haven't mentioned the M word in this talk, for example. And I think that's all I need to say, unless somebody has a question. I think I have maybe two or three minutes. Reverend. Um, I saw some muttering about non-fast forward questions. Mm. I don't know. It let like, it do its thing. 
I didn't really, yeah, I don't know. Oh, look, it's actually provisioning the Docker container now. Uh, so it has to, of course, go off and download security updates because I, uh, my propeller configuration, I have standard, you know, that I like to just build from Debian, even though they're Docker images. Why should I go bother running a Docker file and have this perfectly fine configuration language written in Haskell that can just say, oh, make it run on unstable or stable, make it have security updates, make it auto update with this period. Um, I could also mention that um, while I'm writing, while I've written Propeller, which is about 6,000 lines of Haskell code, uh, with about 3,000, I think, of those lines being specific to Propeller and the rest being little libraries that are perfectly generic. I accidentally re-implemented init because it needs to run in the Docker image and say, well, the, the Docker, um, the, the property for this web server um, is down here, and it says app services installed and running, Apache 2. So the propeller just says, well, if Apache 2 isn't running, I better go start it. So I accidentally run it. Um, and also, there's another one where you can say, oh, I have a property, you run something every half an hour, run something every day, whenever, I don't care when. Whoops, that was Anacron, that was 200 lines of code. So it's kind of weird how this is happening. I think you get up there on top of a tower of abstraction and Haskell code and fun stuff, and these things become sort of easy. And I think now I'm almost out of time. One more question? Uh, yes? <laughs> That's okay. This is only for my own personal use and anyone who's crazy enough to go off and edit it. Um, Propeller has this thing where you normally operate inside a Propeller directory in your home directory or wherever you really want to put it. It has all the source code to Propeller, so you can go hack on it in any way that you like. This is a 10% or a 1% or something project for me. It's not, you know, it's not a big important thing. It's just something I made for my own use and if somebody else wants to, you know, but it's not here to take over the world. It's here to take over my systems and make them happy. Yep. You have to put a bang, and of course. Yeah. Yes, you may. That's right, and that's kind of odd. You would have to have state otherwise, and I don't want. I want propeller to be fairly stateless. Right. So I've thought about this. There, that's one thing. Another thing is even on the, in this example, I had the problem with two services on the same port. And in Propeller, I would love to be able to detect that in a type safe manner so that the Haskell compiler can tell me if I accidentally do that. I haven't gotten around to figure out a good way to do that yet. But there's all kinds of fun, you know, options. Um, this web server publishes the outside, it's a Docker image that publishes what is on the outside uh, VRWW inside the image. So now I could go in, let me see, go back up here. Um, am I out of time? Please just tell me if I am, because I'm coding. Okay, thank you. Uh, whoop, no. Uh, mm, is that right? No. Uh, let's do this. Uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, no, wrong one. And the other one's still running. Hmm. I think Propeller won't let me run two uh, instances at once, but in a few minutes you can go to the web server and see the whole world. So, okay, thanks. On to the next one. I think the biggest delaying factor is actually me. Next up, Malga with Ariero. And I'll totally come back again in a moment. It's not showing what it showed like half an hour ago. I tested this earlier. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. Yay. Um, so, our ERO is a tool for maintaining a lot of packages if you maintain them in Git. So, it only works for Git. It doesn't work for other version control systems or other ways of maintaining packages. I'm not, it's not the Git, it's just if you use Git build package. So, if you have your package in, Gil, in Git. Um, the idea of the tool is to simplify all the tasks that you have to do that are automatable, things that are not uh, brain using. Um, oh, this is not the window I wanted to show. Yeah. I wanted to start in the other desktop. Here. Okay. So it has a bunch of commands. Uh, clone, list, pull, push, update. I will show a few of those. I will start with clone. So if you have an existing git repo for a package, as I said, this uses git build package, so it has to be a package that works with git build package. Uh, it supports the several different um, overlays, so several different configurations of how you uh, structure your package, but uh, it needs to use git build package. So I cloned it, and it downloaded the package is Space Arrow. It's a game that I maintain. It's not relevant for the talk. Um, so it, it created this directory. And now if I ask for status of Space Arrow, it will tell me that it has a new upstream version. So I will do update, file loss focus. Oh, I forgot the dash p. Uh, I I used to complain that it was too no, too yeah too noisy, and I, I made it quiet. And now if I don't say dash v, it's too quiet. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so now it already has the new upstream version. And so if I change into this directory and look at the change log, it already has the new upstream release. And it already created the change log, and yeah, so the new version is there. This uses Cow Builder. This, this is the reason that it's not in testing currently because Cow Builder was removed from testing and so Arriero was also removed from testing. But I'm hoping that we can fix that and get Cow Builder into testing. Yeah, it doesn't build. <laughs> I knew it in advance that it wouldn't build. It's fine. Uh, there's a patch that has been applied upstream. And so it needs to be like refreshed. But I'm not going to do that in the demo. I want to show another thing. So that was for like one package. I cloned the package, I updated the package, I was trying to build the package, but it failed. Uh, now, uh, I also have a lot of packages for Cinnamon. So those packages for Cinnamon are in a file that I have, arrierocinnamon.conf, that has only the packages for Cinnamon. So uh, if I list the status for all of them, the dash A means all the packages in that file. Well, this seems to be slower than it used to be. <laughs> so it will list the status of, of all the packages. Um, hmm, the interesting ones are not yet there. Uh, so, for example, here it says this package has been built but not signed because I, I built it earlier today but I didn't upload it yet. Or these ones say that are unreleased because I've been making changes to them but I didn't build them. So, I can, for example, build all the ones that are unreleased. So, which ones do I need to build? Cinnamon, Cinnamon Session, which I yes. So, cinnamon, cinnamon session, and CJS. And I think those were the ones that I wanted to build. And settings thing. So, I will now start building that, those. As you may have noticed, it up updates. Uh, the Cow Builder instance every time so that it has a, an updated instance. 
and now it's building. So I, I asked it to build all those packages. If there are internal dependencies, it will resolve those. I will show the configuration file while this is building. So, for example, here, Cinnamon screensaver depends on Cinnamon desktop. So if I'm asking this, uh, I'm asking it to build these packages, it will build them in the right order. And in order for that to work, uh, I need to upload them to like an internal repo, and it also can do that. So if I, I need to do that, I can just upload them to the internal repo, and it will do in the right order. So you need, obviously, to specify this, because it's, well, not obviously, but it's not yet so intelligent that it can uh, realize the dependencies. It could be, but it's not yet. But if you specify this, it will build in the right order. So this is now building, we will let it build. But I had one that was already built and just ready to be uploaded, so I'm going to do that now. Uh, so here I'm using the exec command, which can operate on any packages and can receive, like here it's receiving the changes file and can receive a bunch of different uh, fields that I may want to use. In this case, it's the changes file, but I could want to operate on many variables on the packages. And so, which one was the one that I wanted to upload? Control center, right? Uh, build but not sign, control center. So, let's sign and upload Cinnamon control center. No. Yeah, and it's uploading. So I did it uh, for one package, but I could have done it for like all the packages. Um, and uh, yeah, if I had like a, a catcher of the key, I wouldn't have to <laughs> write my password every time. Otherwise I need to write my password every time for each package. Yeah, and um, that's basically it. I have time for maybe one question. No? No questions? Okay, thank you very much. while we change. Um, next up is Pabs with check all the things. All of them, not just some of them. All of them. Okay, so uh, initially I started out with this as a P-Builder hook for checking all of the things. Um, as you can tell, it's not all that maintainable. Did you break the um, bigger? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the whole point. <laughs> um, so I started working on refactoring and rewriting it and it was equally as bad. But then I found out that Jacob Wilk has started also rewriting it at the same time in a Python script and a much more maintainable manner. Um, this is what it looks like. Checks a bunch of things with a bunch of tools um, and you get a lot of output. <laughs> and these are all the things that it didn't check because there was nothing matching. Um, yeah. As you can see, it can check a lot of things. Um, and there are many, many more things that could be checked. Um, if anyone wants to help with all those new things, that would be great. Um, yeah. 
And the whole point of this is to check all of the things and fix all of the things before you upload, or just the ones that you have time to fix. Okay. So it's meant to be package checking? Yes. Um, eventually when Enrico's dead dry thing um, works, you might be able to automatically package and check some upstream code. Any questions? Um, where's the microphone? No, it, it, because it, so many different tools and they all have different output formats. Something like that is, is um, suited for the Firehose project, which aims to, uh, it has a standardized machine readable output format for static analysis tools. And so you could write a bunch of output passes for the, that generate that and then put that on the web, which is something that Pull Tag is working on. Um, this is just something for humans to read and, and filter through. Um, so this is the readme, hopefully it's readable. Yeah. <coughs> oh yeah. It's pretty easy to, to, thanks to the work of Jacob, it's pretty easy to write new tests. Um, one line of matching files and one line of command, and in the future there'll be mime type matching as well. I haven't re implemented that yet. So yeah. Any other questions? Where this? this is in CollabMate. Git repository is called check all the things dot git with dashes. And please commit new tests. Right, we are more than halfway through. Now come the bits where I actually have to read. Um, the next person up is Kumar Sukhani, um, and he is presenting Lil Debbie. Hello? Hello. No, I'm done. Hello? Hello? What happened?
we can start actually i got two demos so you only decide which you which seems interesting to you one is the little debbie which i have mentioned it is running debian on android and the other one is uh, alexi on android it's running two android instances on an emulator that is ics and jellymean simultaneously so first or second Actually, first I have shown already. There were not many people at that time. So, first one. Yes. So, it's already running on my phone. Uh, I'm capturing my screen using Wi-Fi, so it's a bit slow. Uh, this is the UI of the app. Um, I've already installed it because installation takes some time. So after you install it. Uh, you have to click on the install button. It will ask you related to which Debian version you have to install and which architecture, ARM or EL or ARM HF. After that, you will see this screen, Start Debian. I'm not sure if everyone can see that. After clicking on Start Debian, the Debian, uh, it doesn't start up the UI. It only it runs the uh command line so i can use uh, android terminal uh, application to run trigger the command line uh, commands so it's it's not visible to you so this is just the emulator application which can run the Debian commands and you can write scripts and all in this. It's totally an uh, Debian root FS which has even uh, Android devices mounted in it. That's it. Huh? Yes. We can. So the other one is also running. Uh, this is ICS. No, it's Jellybean. Sorry. Four point one. Uh, I'm using Alexi uh, Linux containers to run two instances. For that, I have made changes in the Linux kernel. I am using 2.6.29, I guess. For that, I have to enable few Alexi related features which are essential for running Alexi. And uh, I am using host as an stripped and write, which is just um, just I'm just using uh, ADBD for it, and it just starts the two container. Like it's a controlling host kind of thing. It doesn't run the GUI. And I have run this application which does the switching. So actually, I have to run this as a service. So volume, but uh, volume up or some combination of the keys for container one and other combination of keys for container two. So uh, now it's ICS. Four point zero. The kernel is the same, two point six point twenty nine. That's it. Can you switch out of that container and into, into the other one? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to the same way. And last but not least, 
soon as I manage to get my phone to stop. Um, last but not least, we have Abhishek Bhattacharji, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, um, doing, <coughs> sorry, giving us the DEP11 generator, and that's a GSOC project. And we'll just take a moment to do set up. Okay, so uh, so this is this was my GSOC project this year. Uh, it's it's basically adding a feature to uh, DAC, uh, which is Debian Archive Kit. So uh, DP11 is uh, Debian Enhancement Proposal Number 11. So it's about AppStream adding the feature of AppStream to uh, Debian. So what basically this does is a, uh, it is a generator. Uh, this piece of code is a generator which will uh, generate some data uh, according to the AppStream uh, specifications. And so basically what I did was adding a command to DAC uh, to generate data. So what you do is uh, you run this command uh, with a, a sweet name option. You provide the sweet <coughs> name for which you want to generate the data. And you, I'll just show you the usage. But uh, so, so the main option is to add a suite name, and the next is uh, you can clear the cache. Uh, that means uh, if you have some stale uh, data residing in your service, you can clear it using the minus C option. Yep. So I'll just show you uh, what it does. So it will uh, read some data. It takes some time. It will read the data. Okay. Yep. Hmm. It's not working. Huh? Yeah. Is this good? Okay. Yeah. So this is the command uh, which you run. So, so it says it's reading data. It reads the data from uh, the DAG uh, database, which is uh, on a Postgres database. And it will uh, print something that uh, will print all the uh, dev files that it is uh, passing, so from the suite. And what it does is it uh, takes the icons out of it and it saves the icon. It will also saves the uh, save the screenshot if it has got any. So uh, now uh, because I don't have much time, so I'm just uh, running it for the contrib component. So. Uh, we have other tool uh, uh, that is non-free and main, so which are uh, rather a uh, bigger. Main is kind of bigger, which takes a lot of time. So it will also fetch out the screenshots and it will keep it in a uh, keep it in your server. So uh, this is how the data looks. 
so this is it says uh, the file it's it has got a header it uh, says it says the version of the app stream and the suite name uh, then it will have data for each component uh, of the packages which we passed so it will have various stuff like this so uh, for example it also it also supports localization if you have a package name in several languages it will keep those data also so this will have several such files like this. Uh, this is uh, AMD64 architecture. So uh, we have different ar files for different architectures. And the icons kind of, uh, this will look like this. So I'll just show you. So uh, this is kind of what I save in the server. So <coughs> there will be icons, and this is basically a naming uh, Can you see this? Oh, yeah? No? Sorry. Yes? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the suite name, this is the component parts, and then we have a naming specification for each uh, directories, so that when we are using the clear cache command, we can find uh, the stale uh, data. So for example, if I'm removing some package and I don't need uh, data of that package anymore, so that's when I uh, run the clear cache command, and so that it can find out which data it needs to remove so for that uh, this naming specification has been used. So we have icons stored here. We also have screenshots, which was a result of a previous run, for example, this. So this is a screenshot of this package. So what I do is I uh, fetch out uh, it from the URL that has been provided in the uh, files inside the uh, package. And then I again change the URL to our servers, uh, to the FTP servers, so that it can be accessed uh, by the user, whoever using the data, the YML data that, that is being generated. So whoever, use, whoever is using that data can uh, access the screenshots. And that's how this data looks. So this is this can be used by uh, software center like applications to make a, a software center uh, like application basically so uh, it will have a library which will read this data that is being generated so that libraries can be used by for example uh, some application like apper or ubuntu software center for example they can use uh, that library to read the data that is being generated and then it can uh, provide various kind of uh, uh, information to the user who is installing a package. It can uh, provide it with screenshots, dependencies, binaries and libraries it installs and stuff like that. So that was, that's it. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Right. Many, many thanks to everybody who came and presented. And for similarly themed light entertainment, there will be the lightning talks on Sunday evening just before the closing ceremony. See you there.